Good afternoon. Uh, I'm so happy today uh, calling the meeting to order of the Board of Adjustment, and I'm happy it's not pouring down rain or flooding down our street this afternoon. Um, we're calling to order, and um, the first item is to receive the minutes of April 18, 2019 meeting, and I need a motion. A motion to receive the minutes uh, from April 18, 2019. Second. I have a motion and a second to receive the minutes of April 18. Please cast your votes. The motion has passed. The minutes are received. Uh, Clerk, do we have any uh, continuance or requests for withdrawals? We have uh, item one, case number 14578. The applicant has uh, requested to withdraw this item. And we have item seven, case number 14599. Want to continue this to May 16th? Okay, so number the first item has been withdrawn. As to the second item, I, do we have a motion to continue? Motion to continue the item number seven, case number one four five nine nine. To uh, May 16th. To May 16th. Second. I have a motion to second to continue, Adam. Let's vote on it, please. The item has been continued to May 16th. Um, before the items are called for a separate vote, uh, I forgot to mention, uh, of course, everybody knows to turn your devices off or put them in airplane mode. And some of you have been here many times and some have not. So the ones who have not, just a, uh, the instructions are pretty much on the second page of your agenda if you have it. But basically, we are here to call the cases. The applicant comes forward. Uh, if you are wanting to be heard on the matter and you're not the applicant or representative of the applicant, you need to fill out one of these slips. Um, in addition, when you do present, you, are, you put forward your case and keep it as succinctly as possible. And it, we will ask if other people want to be heard on the matter. So. Uh, we will ask on that. The board members will have questions, and then we will take a vote. Uh, so are we ready for case number one, please? No, or number two, I'm sorry. Item number two, case number 14581, request for a variance to allow more than one sign per street frontage and the eight-foot maximum height in the R1 single-family residential district located at 5701 Mackleman Drive. Good afternoon. Mason Schwartz, 522 Colcord Drive. Here on behalf of the applicant, uh, what we have handed you is a packet with three tabs. Um, it's for all three of these cases, items two, three, and four. Uh, tab one is for this particular case, which is where we'll start, but if you would consolidate them because they're all uh, regarding our client, um, who's a school district seeking uh, sign variances. So the uh, agenda item number two, the first application item at issue is um, elementary school located uh, on 59th near Sooner, just west of Tinker. Uh, it's zoned R1, approximately 13.8 acres. Uh, currently on the property, if you'll turn to tab one, <clears throat> about the fourth page in, there is already an existing freestanding marquee sign on the property. Uh, what we're really seeking to do here today is to commit to take that down and replace it um, with an updated new freestanding um, <clears throat> accessory sign. So I, I have a question before you proceed further. I don't believe it has a permit or has, do you have any history on the permitting of, for that sign? As I understand it, it's legally non-conforming, but... Well, if it's never been permitted, it's probably legal non-conforming, but I'll defer to the attorney. Uh, yeah, if we don't have any record of having um, permitted this before, I don't know what the status might be, but there is the potential for it to be legally non-conforming. Sure, I, I'm not exactly sure of the status of the permit at this, at this moment. I can determine it, but I think at minimum, it would be legally non-conforming. So, but the essence of what we're trying to do is, is take that down, replace it with what we see as a much better um, aesthetically sign and functionally speaking sign. Um, so what we are proposing, if we'll turn to behind that existing marquee sign, um, approximately page five of tab one, uh, is a 13 foot, eight inch sign. It is. Um, within eight inches of what the current sign is, so essentially the same in height. Um, it will have an EMD component on the bottom there. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
and it will be approximately in the same location as the one we're taking down, which is uh, right about 40 feet from the road frontage. So uh, real quick as to why this particular sign is necessary in our opinion. Um, as this board has had before uh, in the past, uh, schools kind of run into uh, unique uh, problems in terms of signage are often located in residential districts and subject to uh, residential signage regulations, which is the case here, um, which is really just not workable in many instances for schools. So uh, <clears throat> here the proposed sign will serve several, several critical purposes. In terms of the EMD, the EMD is really necessary for an elementary school like this in terms of uh, program announcements and community outreach, um, everything from weather updates, uh, closings to, um, you know, what the cafeteria is going to be used for uh, next week. Uh, it's critical that as parents come and pick their kids up on a daily basis, they're able to kind of see these announcements um, and engage with the community. <clears throat> um, the other part of the EMDs, it can also serve wayfinding purposes. There are three different entrances to this property, and so it can make getting in and out in terms of a child drop off and pick up a little difficult. Uh, in terms of the height, the 13 feet, uh, it, <clears throat> Again, it's, it's important for we think as the cars are coming in and out to be able to see uh, the messages um, <clears throat> clearly. Uh, also, in terms of the height, you'll notice the six-foot um, height between where the EMD starts and, and the bottom of it. And our applicant operates dozens of schools around the metro area and finds pretty consistently that the uh, shorter <clears throat> these types of signs are, the more subject they are to um, either. Uh, incidental or purposeful uh, damage, whether it's vandalism or just kids being kids uh, or just, you know, accidental damage. And so th this elevation between the ground and where the EMD sign starts, uh, we believe is, is kind of critical to uh, protecting the sign going forward. So uh, in essence, we, we believe we're asking for replacing the current sign with something that's comparable uh, and much more functional and better aesthetically speaking. Um, we are unaware of any protests. Happy to answer any questions, and we would ask for your approval. I have one question, then I'll turn it over to the board. Uh, could you not have it at the same height as it originally is, as opposed to going another eight inches? I'm sorry. Could it not be 13 instead of 13.8. So I think that this 13.8 number, these signs are part of a whole new wave of packages that our clients. Uh, going in with across uh, the metro. I think three of them are in Oklahoma City, but many of them are out in Oklahoma County. So I think they were standardizing the, me the dimensions and they came to 13.8. Um, we do have a representative here. If, if the eight inches are um, a deal breaker, we can certainly discuss that. But I think the, the eight was just, it wasn't specifically looking at uh, measuring what the current sign is as to they were finding a number that worked for many locations across um, their various locations. Are there other schools where the, the signage is used other than the one application before you and the other ones or in other cities or other communities or architects have designed that height and that width? Yes, yeah, so this current design, I, you might be, our client may be able to speak to this a little bit, but as I understand it, there are eight or nine of these signs going in throughout the Oklahoma County area where they don't have the same regulations in place. Um, and so, again, this is part of a number of signs that our clients are doing at this particular height and this particular specifications. Are they EMD ones or twos? Or? Uh, I believe they're EMD one. Um, it's just kind of basic scrolling. How bright? The net column. How bright? Um, I am not sure if whether or not the application itself specifies it. Um, but I could try to determine that if necessary. The EMD-1 would meet code for R1 zoning, and they do regulate the uh, brightness. The brightness. Like that's the one thing that concerns me. Uh, with this specific application, it's right in a neighborhood and right across the street from a residence. Sure, and the one thing, if you kind of look at how the uh, sign currently is positioned, and, and as I understand, this one will be positioned, is north and south, so it won't directly face the residential to the east, um, it'll face the kind of north and south. So hopefully that would uh, help call some of those concerns. Any other questions? Um, so it will be facing, in what direction will it be facing? 
it, it'll be a north and south facing sign. So if you go, if you turn to the second page of tab one, you can kind of see where that existing sign is. Um, we've got an arrow indicating it. And it is, you can see the face of it is facing south. Um, so it's positioned to where one face is facing north, one face is facing south. And so this will be the same way. That way it's not facing, the EMD is not facing toward the residential on the east. Okay. Uh, are there any individuals who uh, want, who signed up? No one has signed up to be heard. Any individuals want to, to speak on the matter? And you did say the applicant or you, you guys are okay if, uh, if we're looking at replacing the sign. I know there is a eight inches difference, but you'll be okay if, if it's just replacing staying at the 13 feet that is currently? If it was, I think that's something we could probably discuss if it was critical. Um, but, but to us, again, I think it's being able to use these specifications that we're using all over the place in terms of uh, keeping it standard with the rest of our sign package um, is is definitely preferable. Uh, and I, I mean, in our view, I think the eight inches, um, it, it is eight inches is the difference, mm -hmm. but we think it's, it's minimal. Okay. So. Uh, John, can you give us some input in other school systems and maybe use to have a reference on the height of the signs that they use? Well, we, we do it by the zone of the property. And since the zone of the property is residential, that's the reason the height can only be eight feet in height. It's, it's not the school districts, but it's the height of the, for the zoning district. Sure, and we've had cases, uh, I came before this board last year on a case, one on Southwest 44th and one on Southwest 15th, um, and, and there was um, an EMD sign and, and some height variance as well. And it was, it was kind of the same concerns where it's, you've got an R1 zoning, and so you're subject to uh, residential signs regulations, but I mean, you're talking about a 20 acre, 15 acre um, school campus, I mean, that's just, not ad adequate, but you know, schools are unique because they're one of these you know very rare uses that are allowed to be used in residential, um, and so they have this kind of unique issue with science regulations. Thank you. I'll weigh in a little bit uh, on schools, I, I, and especially in this area. There, uh, the only concern is Mike brought up was that there's a resident across the street, but you're still entitled to have the MD, even if it's at eight feet or whatever. So it would still be there and and being used. Uh, and you've said that you post, you're going to place it in an area will not be bright and facing any residents. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, because the idea is that as you pull in on the drives, you want to be able to, for the, for the parents that are in line that are facing east-west, they want to be able to look out their window and see it to the south or to the north. Um, and, and further, again, with the, the EMB already being allowed in R1 and controlled, it, one of the things specifically that is controlled is the brightness. Um, so we mean we will meet all the, the codes in terms of uh, controlling brightness in R1. I, uh, I would uh, support this one even though uh, it's been in place and that doesn't make it completely non-conforming because I don't think it had a permit in the beginning, but it's been used and operated, and I think it's very difficult for people seeing schools to know where things are located and do the wayfinding and information. It's very difficult. Um, so I would weigh in that I, I wish it would be at the same height as it currently is, as opposed to 13 eight. I, I hate to ask for going even in, even in higher, but I think that eight is probably insignificant compared to the 13. So um, I'll defer to the others for comments or motions. And I will also support the application. I know we've seen several, we've seen other schools that are in our one area. And like you stated, I mean, it's a small difference and the sign's been there for some time, so. Yeah, with all that said, um, it's definitely a much better looking sign than what they have now. I can support it. Um, and I'll make a motion to uh, approve case number 14581, reasons that it meets the statutory requirements. Second. We have a motion and a second uh, to approve the variance in case number 14581. Uh, please cast your votes. 
Barrett, just been granted. Thank you, and I'm going to stay put for the next two here. Um, again, for the record, Mason Schwartz, 522, call Core Drive. Let me go ahead and call this one. After John calls it. Item number three, case number 14582, request for a variance to the eight foot maximum height, sign height in the R1 single family residential district, located at 10551 Southeast 59th Street. So I will save us the, uh, the time of going through all the stuff we've already gone over, but I, I do want to point out the differences in this between the last application. Um, first, let me talk about what's the same. The sign is the same that we're proposing. Um, in the sign that's being removed, the marquee sign is uh, the same as well. Um, it's about 50 feet, a little farther back. Again, we're going to remove it. We're going to replace it um, with you know, what we have in here. Uh, this is on Southwest 59th. Um, which is a you know a section line major arterial or, or an arterial road anyhow. So we think that hopefully there's a little bit less concern here in terms of um, the residential across the street. Uh, but in any event, this will be set back at the you know the even amount um, that is is currently in place. Um, so we would kind of just reincorporate everything we talked about earlier uh, regarding the need for it and the EMD and the height and the unique nature of. Uh, signs again, unaware of any protests, and would ask for your approval. Questions or concerns? I think there was a discussion about residents. So I'd like a little more discussion <clears throat> on that, too. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. A little less concern on this one because, as Mason said, it's on 59th. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. And this, I mean, the setback between this and the closest residents, just looking at what we've got here, is we're talking much, much farther, I think, than the, the one before. It'd be the same deal facing uh, north or correct, yes, east and west on the sign faces. And, yeah, so. Correct. Does anybody want to be heard on this matter? We have no, no comments from any of the public. No, I, I, I will um, support this case as well. So I can uh, make the motion to approve case 14582 uh, for the reasons that it meets the statutory requirements for a variance. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, cast your votes. Thank you again. It was great. Item number four, case number 14583, request for a variance to allow more than one sign per street frontage and to the eight foot minimum height in the R1 single family residential district located at 5301 Dimple Drive. Again, Mason Schwartz, 522 Colcord Drive on behalf of the applicant. Um, once again, we'll just reincorporate everything that we talked about over the last two applications. Uh, there are a couple differences. The existing marquee sign on this location is actually much taller. Uh, it's about 19 feet, and it's already got an EMB component to it. Um, and so there is images, there are images of that existing marquee in this tab three, um, third or fourth page back. Um, again, we will be removing it, replacing it with this 13 foot, eight inch. So taking the sign height actually down, and once again, as we think a much um, more pleasant, aesthetically speaking, sign. Um, and we will be changing the location of it. We, the, the first slide you had up was the existing one is a little bit farther north on the property um, and it's much closer to the street. The, what we're replacing it with and what we're asking for will actually be on the south piece and it will be uh, farther away from the street, further setback. So, again, we would happy to answer any questions and ask your approval. This one's across from commercial too, isn't it? Uh, correct. There are. Well, there are apartments, as we understand it, directly across um, the, the street from this. So. If there are apartments, how is that going to affect the apartments uh, with respect to the placement and the lighting and the location and the height of the signs? So we actually think, again, there, there is an E&B component currently in place. And so there already is some, some lighting going on there on the sign. We th we're moving it farther away, really, from the apartment. So if you look at where the current sign is, 
you're directly across from the piece of the apartment complex that is uh, about as close as it gets to the road. Where we're putting it on the south of our property now will be the distance now between this and the closest apartment unit building will be farther away. We have no other comments from anybody in the public. Uh, I think we had one other person arrive, so I didn't know if that individual had any comments. Board members? Um, I can support this application. Okay, Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve case number 14583. Second. A motion and a second uh, to uh, approve the variance, case number 14583. Cast your, uh, cast your votes. And granted. Thank you. We have item number five, case number 14592, request for a variance to hard surface parking requirement in the I-2 Moderate Industrial District, located at 8201 Pole Road. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I've got a host of individuals here in case any specific questions arise. Uh, but what we seek today is a variance to allow uh, us to do a gravel uh, yard because of the unique nature of, of the business that my client operates. Uh, my client is in the business of providing materials and services for large uh, electric utilities. Uh, think of OG&E, when uh, a storm happens and they have to get new transformers, new wires, new things like that, uh, this company provides the location in which it's stored that can then be deployed around the state. As you might imagine, by looking at this image, the size and the scale of some of the equipment, it doesn't lend itself to concrete. The reason being, if you look at the bottom, you'll see the types of machines used to move these items around the site. Uh, the concrete or asphalt would be in a constant state of disrepair. Uh, in addition to safety issues if there were ice or, or things like that. And so it's, it is not uncommon when you have a use like this in an industrial type area that you have a gravel lot primarily for that reason. The storage of this material just does not lend itself uh, to, to be on hard surface. Um, so when we think about what the hardship is, it's just that. The, the ordinance, if we were required to follow it, would require us to install a, a surface at a very expensive cost that wouldn't support the type of use uh, that will be going on here. Um, it's unique in that when you look at the way that the site is laid out, um, this will probably help. The building is here, and you see different shades here. Uh, the access drive here, this will actually be a hard surface, and this will be asphalt. This area right here, which is behind the building, is the only area that will be graveled. It's an engineer gravel, so it's not just gravel kind of thrown out. It's multiple layers of subgrade. Um, all of this is actually going to be concrete, and so uh, we meet that, what I believe, we meet that fourth element, that being the, the least necessary, in that we have limited the gravel area to just the area in which the, the materials will be stored. And so because of that, and in looking at the area, I think you'd see other yards that also have gravel, and depending on the length of time you've been on the board, you will no doubt have seen other variance applications for the same, um, the same type of application. So. Uh, staff did not find any unfavorable conditions. I believe this is consistent and common with what you'd expect to see in an industrial yard. I'm not aware of any protests. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and we'd ask for your approval. Um, so are you asking for a permanent one? You anticipate that's going to be at the, the use of that location for yes, storage? Ma yes, ma'am. We've approved something similar to that where we had high construct, a high, there were a lot of heavy vehicles and storage and trucks and trailers and different things coming and uh, in looking at that, you, it, it would destroy whatever pavement you would have uh, in the event that it's no longer being used. I don't think you've said this, but would you be willing to? to pave it if it's no longer being used at some point down the line? Uh, just a question. Well, if we're not, I mean, it, it will always be used for storage as long as my client, you know, operates that. Are you asking in the event that they're, they're gone? In the event it's no longer being used for storage by your client. Uh, oh. What? Yeah. 
in the event that it wasn't ever, that, it, that they didn't need it for storage, that would be fine. They, I mean, they don't anticipate that. I mean, that, that's why they've shrunk down the area that they're requesting it to just the area that they know they're going to need for the storage of, of the large materials, but um, that would be fine. Board member questions? Can you talk a little bit more? And I know you explain everything of the use. What are they using right now? Have they been using, have the gravel? And is that what they've been having there for a while now? Or did they move into this facility and that's why they're? So this would be a new facility. Okay. That's right. And where they are right now, they do have gravel Correct. for that storage. Okay. As stated, yeah, we've seen stuff like this before and it makes sense to uh, be gravel and not concrete. Is anybody wanting to be heard on this matter? Nobody has signed up to discuss it. Um, is it possible, I'm asking attorney, if it could be conditioned as, to, as long as so long as it's being used for storage as part of the variance motion? Um, yeah, the the um, variance would be limited to what is stated in the application. So if since this is specifically for outdoor storage, if it were no longer being used for that, then that would be violating a, a condition of the variance. Because to be clear, it, it may be that every square inch of the gravel yard at any particular time didn't have something on it, but the ability to plan and have the, the adequate storage space, I mean, we're fine with limiting the gravel to the, the site indicated within our site plan. I believe we'll support your application, so I make a motion to approve case 14592 for the reason that it meets the statutory requirements for a variance. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve case number 14592. Please cast your votes. Thank you. Item number six, case number 14598, request for a variance to the minimum 200 foot of feet of separation of drives and the minimum 100 feet of separation of a drive to the north property line in PUD 163 located at 15700 North Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, my name is Eugene Hadfield. I represent the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the owner of the property adjacent to the property in, in the subject. And I'm also by a, a letter authorization representing the, the owner of the property in question, Marathon Oil Company. Uh, and I'm basically here just to answer questions. Uh, I'm just in just a real brief summary. Uh, we have our, we're constructing a church meeting house at this location and it's approximately 75% complete at this time. When we started construction, we noticed the traffic on Penn Avenue was uh, heavier than we anticipated, and there resulted a concern about the safety of our congregates as they exit the property. And so in examining the alternatives, we come up with this uh, solution of, of obtaining an easement from the adjoining property owner, Marathon Oil, to be able to uh, get a second access egress from, the pro from our church property. Uh, Marathon has agreed to that, and uh, uh, but the, from according to the uh, Jesse Richard, the plan examiner, he's indicated that there's a uh, 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 would require a variance because there's a PUD that's involved in that, and that re requires the uh, a variance because the separation of the uh, drives and the minimum uh, from the drive to the north property line, uh, and so that's. I'm here to ask questions and request that variance on behalf of Marathon Oil that, rep that is the legal owner of the property and we have an arrangement with them to, for them to grant an easement to us to uh, uh, use this as a second entrance so we can obtain the ver uh, 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 access to that property variance. Without the approval, would you be able to have the Operate, would it be able to be done without the, without this variance? Well, we can exit the property. We have a we have the main entrance that's now been approved by the city, and we have the plans approved, and we're going forth building that entrance. But their concern is that uh, when when the 
uh, congregants come or leave the church meetings that, uh, that, it's, that could create a possible traffic congestion at that exit point. And if we had the second e egress, that would allow the more, uh, flu uh, more smooth exit from the, from the meeting house. It would also provide a second as access to, uh, uh, for emergency vehicles as well. How does that street just looks like it dead ends or something? I was trying to look at the street when I went out there. It looks like it, it would be difficult to access uh, without some approval. Yeah, my understanding is that uh, Marathon Oil would not have any other access to that property unless that unless they have that access. At, at this point, they have no future plans for that. I think there's some 20 acres back there that uh, it's designated as a green space. They can only be used as uh, parks or, or similar kind of things, but at this point, Marathon has no plan for that. So our intent was only just to uh, access uh, um, their property right uh, just before the street. I think it's on that other exhibit that shows that on the drawing shows the, uh, um, the amount of what we'll be looking at it for the construction. Before I ask for public, uh, and there are a couple of people signed up. Yeah. Uh, board members, do you have any questions? I think we have two individuals who've signed up to be heard on this matter. Eugene Hatfield? Uh, that's me. I'm sorry. That's you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Just one then. Mr. Shoemaker. I'm Robert Shoemaker, and I represent the Vintage Gardens 1 uh, condominium area, which is the PUD 480 that you see. Could you give us your address, please? Pardon? Could you give us your address, please? Yes. I live at 1908 Northwest 157th Street, which is at the south bounding edge of the church property in question. The boundary fence that exists there now between the OG and easement and us, and then we're talking about where they're asking for their exception and then the church property. Our main question is, and he might have answered it, was that in that panhandle strip there, just how limited an access is that going to be to marathon further versus this is strictly a paving access only to the church property and has an eastern ending to it. John. Well, they're showing that they're, they're bringing the approach into the property on marathon oil. It goes down and stops. It's not curbed. And then the church is getting a uh, access easement to be able to use their drive, but the drive is for the Marathon Oil property. The hardship is for Marathon Oil, not so much the church, but, but Marathon Oil does not have any kind of access into their property. So I think what he's asking is, anything can Marathon else? extend that driveway on into their property <clears throat> after this? If they so choose? Yes, yes. Once. Uh, once the approach is put in, just because the drive stops, it doesn't mean that it couldn't be extended on into the property. Is there anything presently requested as to how far east Marathon is wanting this first access created in terms of feet? Uh, Cindy, if you can put that other map up. It shows on uh, one of the maps we have where they're stopping. you look up at the, go back down the other way, Cindy. At the top, they show, it doesn't show a distance, but it looks like it's no more than about 100 feet or so. And then it stops, 
And if you notice, they put in there no curb in this area. That's because later on they could continue on with the yeah. drive or. Yeah. One reason we're concerned about that is through the years, we have extraneous traffic back in there, individuals using it to dump trash, people using it after dark. So creating this access has concerned us that it creates a next step in access and availability to that. We also have the obvious concern on what this will do to traffic on PIN. Uh, regardless of the variance requests, it's putting two different entrance and exits this close together in a very busy uh, section of North Penn and the fence immediately north that boundaries the uh, office park. Uh, that is a six foot high stockade fence. It does create some visibility problems. And we're concerned in general that there's a traffic situation being created by doing this and why not just leave it to what the church had originally planned as the access they now have cut and ready to pave as their central entrance point. Those are our concerns. Thank you. Uh, we did send out uh, notices to the departments. Did you have any adverse uh, comments by traffic or anybody else? No. Is there another person I'm wanting to be heard? I signed and haven't turned it in. Okay. Could you state your name, address, and? Uh... Excuse me, I've, I've never done this before. So, um, my name is John Burbank. I live at 15805 Napa Ridge, and I would be the furthest to west uh, duplex. Uh, that backs up to the corner of the existing office park on the west side of me. Um, I am concerned about the traffic uh, of those three roadways all crowded together. On the map, the, the duplex that's sitting on an angle on, on my left or on the west side of Vintage Gardens, I live in the west duplex there, and I travel up and down Penn every day, uh, except when the traffic is really bad at Penn and Memorial because all the congestion and those drives that I have to take either western or go down to Portland on 150th. I'm concerned about the traffic being backed up with that many driveways, with the three driveways that are close together and also that whole subject area with only the designated entrance to that area going right behind my house and not having the safety features of the 100 foot setback as well as the 200 foot between the uh, the other driveways that I think it's you know whoever's planting or whoever owns all of this when they went in and uh, did their plat maps and stuff of that nature in the original um, selling of these properties well, why didn't they uh, address this traffic issue or these roadway issues before they ever sold the properties and deeded this and that back and forth. Um, I don't think that I should be crowded in on because of their lack of planning, so to speak. So anyhow, that's my two cents worth and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh I'm going to ask for the applicant for rebuttal, but is there anyone else who hasn't spoken who wishes to speak on the matter? Either a representative or another member representing the applicant to respond? Um, my name is Jason Francis. I live at 3604 Northwest 175th Street. Uh, about a mile and a half from this proposed location, but I am in the uh, what what we refer to as the stake presidency of the of the church. So over 
uh, eight to ten congregations in the Edmond area. Uh, this new um, building that's been proposed uh, has been, pro been proposed for some time. Our original application, the reason for this accept, uh, variance request is our original application had our, the first driveway much wider than, 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 than got approved. Uh, so we were, we were, to address the one concern, we were planning for, uh, you know, the, the traffic in and out, uh, but it, there, it, we, our request was to match the driveway of the neighborhood directly across the street in width, and the, um, that, that was, uh, event was denied, and so this was our um, kind of workaround for that situation. Um, the, we, we, we will be placing, although it's not a permanent barrier because it's Marathon's property, we would be placing a removable concrete barrier at the eastern terminus of the, of the proposed easement that would prevent traffic from, or people from going back on that property and dumping at night. Because we're, frankly, we're concerned about that as well. We don't want people back behind our church building at, at night and, uh, you know, any nefarious characters back there doing anything. And so, uh, we will be making efforts to, it will be, you know, well lit and we're, we're going to try to um, uh, prevent, uh, uh, you know, take care to, to prevent that. And then um, the, uh, so, trying to think, the, the other concern, the... Uh, Did you draw, uh, I don't believe the schematics or the drawings reflected all of the things you said you were going to be doing, did it? Or... The, um, it, it, that our drawings reflect the barricading and some other things. That yeah, it's it's on about. on the map. You you we can see you can see where the uh, we it's not drawn on that. Uh, go back to that PDF exhibit right now. The the one below that. That one. Yeah. So the where it says no curb in this area that. That's where the the uh, those removable concrete barriers, like they use in high, in you know temporary for highway construction, that we would be placing one of those there that would prevent traffic back behind there. The eastern terminus of that of that easement would bear would uh, I I don't think it would cross the uh, um, beyond the the office park that is there, and if it does, it's it's very minimal. Um, so there would be uh, pretty minimal, you know. The impact on that on the uh, uh, village gardens neighborhood would be de minimis, we believe. So. How uh, how often is the church really at occupancy? The the majority of traffic is on Sundays. Um, that you know, there's there are some uh, youth activities on Wednesday evenings from six to eight p.m. and uh, um, you know the the traffic in and out through the through the week is is very small. But but the Sundays is the um, and it would be from the, the traffic times would be from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Sundays. Would be would I would that would be the heaviest traffic times. So, so d would not affect you know any you know it's our church meetings are definitely not at high traffic times, so it wouldn't affect wouldn't be much of an effect on traffic on Penn. And I don't know. If, uh, I don't think you can see it from the map that you have here. But do you plan any landscaping in between the drive? And the fence or the other properties. Um, we we haven't planned any, but I don't think that that's anything that would be against our. You know, if, if that's a make or break deal, I think we would be accommodating for that. I'm just thinking about lighting or noise or things mm -hmm. that can sure. be diminished uh, by using some landscaping there. Right. Um, that, does yet, Mr. Hadfield? Do you have anything you would like to add? Or anybody else? Or is there another person who wants to be heard on this matter and you have a piece of paper? Would you like to be heard on this matter? We're not going to ask for the people who have already spoken to respond until we have our applicant respond. Uh, if you've already spoken on this matter, uh, Either an applicant, a representative, or someone okay. else. I, I am Paul Mowbray, and I'm with GHN Architects Engineers, and I'm working with the church on this project. So, you know, any any questions that come along? But I think most everything has been covered. The the, the big issue that the church has is just getting in and out. You know. 
to help eliminate congestion on Pennsylvania Avenue, and that would be not only getting out of the site, but getting in. If you've got two points of access to the site, it would be a lot easier to get in. And also in, for emergency vehicles, if, say, one access point was blocked off. So, and then the church themselves, they're the ones that had contacted Marathon Oil. Marathon did not ask for this initially, but it was, this is Marathon's only access to that land, their landlocked 22.7 acre plot. So it seemed like it would be a sort of a win-win for both if we were to put this driveway in and then if they ever needed access to it, they would have that. I have a question. How would the traffic be increased by making it, by approving this? I don't see that the traffic would change. Oh, uh, it would make term it, it would, coming to and from in your design issues. It would just make it where, you know, if you've got cars exiting the site at two points or entering the site at two points, there's less congestion, especially if people are turning left all bottlenecking into one opening. It's not going to, there's not going to be any more cars parking on the site because there's two entrances. Would you like to be heard? And then I will call on you in just a minute, sir. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick points. First of all, when we, we presented this originally to the uh, city plan examiner, Jesse Richards, and his comment was back that they, we do not, this is a quote, we do not see it as a problem to get an, uh, the variance, but because of the PUD, we cannot approve it. Uh, and he says, let me know if you want to pursue the variance, which we have. And he says, I, def I do definitely agree that there is going to be a traffic jam on Sundays within a single egress, egress point on Penn, but the PUD is very specific. So that's what this is all about. And then i also like to point out I, uh, that uh, if there's concern about access to the property behind us, the, the larger partial marathon oil, we'd be prepared to... Uh, limit that access by putting removable bollards or something at the end of our, the end of that point. If that would if that would alleviate the, the concern about access to the traffic behind there, all we're trying to do is uh, eliminate what we see as a potential traffic concern. Question? I I, I thought you had one more comment to make, sir, and and I'm going to call on uh, John for a minute to discuss. I'm sorry. Uh, something came John Burbank I'm concerned with once you give Marathon Oil access to and from through through this variance that they can create or do whatever they want on the subject property at some given date that is going to change the traffic issue you know they could put uh, apartment complexes back there in some time in the future and once they have the variance that's leading across my property line there's nothing that can be done about it whether they put up as they say temporary barriers to keep people out of that once marathon has the right of way to go through there then it's a done deal that they can do with whatever they want to on that subject property at any given year you know, I have nothing against the church and, and you know, they need access in and out, but it, it just seems like it's not the place to put it. Or if you can restrict Marathon from never being able to um, use that further on to that other property, maybe they can do something on the south side of their property rather than and limit it, then, you know, that might alleviate some of my fears, per se, of Marathon being able to use that at a future date and increase the traffic in their driveway as well as behind my house. Because, you know, if there's no curb and guttering there and it's a temporary thing, Marathon has a right to go through there. They do whatever they want to. There's an existing PD for almost the entire quarter section. Uh, minus at school, um, since that they can't just do anything. They'll have to, you know, either I'm sorry, they'll have to amend their PUD or rezone it again, or they'll have to, you know, they can't just do what they want. I mean, 
Okay. They, so they would have you're saying you can limit, per se, what the traffic is coming behind my house with going ahead and approve this variance for I'm, a driveway? I'm going to call on our attorney to discuss this. A marathon's ability to develop that property is going to be restricted both by the planned unit development that is currently in effect and covers that property and also any deed restrictions. I believe those were referenced in the application. So they're, they're going to be limited by that, how they might be able to develop this and what kind of traffic might eventually end up you know, heading back toward that site. Okay. All right. I just didn't want to give up my rights and things of that nature, you know, to to uh, quality of living. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the staff had some comments on the favorable and uh, were there any unfavorable considerations? I didn't have any unfavorable. That's the only access that Marathon Oil has to their property. I know we've talked a lot about the church, but the hardship is basically for the property itself does not have any access to it. And we could condition this on a stop box or bollards or something to stop this until the property's developed to keep people from going back there. But they would still, they'd still be able to develop it later on. Tom, do you know if Marathon owns the entire entirety of that PUD? No, they, if you look at the map right now, that it's just that ally, started, that's what they own. Just, they own that it, portion right there. Do we know what they, what their interest is in it? We just don't know. Yeah, maybe going to drill a well someday. Or? Don't know what they're going to do with it. But like you said earlier, they can only develop what the PUD allows. Right. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to know. We need to speak up on the podium. If we, uh, um, Marathon, actually, they have drilled wells on that property. They're, they're plugged. I'm actually in the energy industry as well. So at the, they've plugged and abandoned the wells. They have no more interest in, in, uh, in the property. They own the property and that the, there are actually, they, um, they, there are some, there's some environmental li liabilities that they are afraid of. They, they can't sell, they don't want to sell the property because they're afraid of potential environmental liabilities. I think they actually have tried to uh, cede it to get, uh, give it to the city at one point. So there's, there's no, uh, they have no desire in, in further development of the property. So um, they, they do like, they, they did uh, request, you know, ac access to the property in the event that they ever needed to get back there, which would be at, at our, you know, we would be providing this easement at our expense to provide them potential future access if they needed it. So I also that's, work in that industry, so what's that? That makes more. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. So, yeah. So okay. I understand. I think if we did this, we would. My comment would be that we would need to, con as you had suggested, we have a condition on how uh, on this is to the before development, but on the stop walkers or something that would keep that people coming from dumping and otherwise. I do think they're entitled to access and uh, uh, we don't control necessarily uh, what the PUD already uh, entitles them to do. We're not here to determine how they're developing it. That is not our prerogative. We're just here to determine whether we, there's a basis for the, the variance and they have stated that there, and there is no access and they've stated there's a uh, going to be the easement agreement, and the church wants this too. Uh, I mean, because it can be very difficult with just one place, and I can understand the issues dealing with dumping and other access, and that's something that needs somehow in a condition to be addressed that they would would provide uh, for that protection. Um, any can other we, ideas? Can we uh, require a crash gate? Can we require a crash gate? That's restricting access, but allowing access to Marathon with a lock, and, uh, you know, instead of the concrete barriers, yeah. you know, if they need yeah, to you get can, back You can condition can... it on whatever you want to. Right. I'd, I'd be comfortable with a crash gate more than a concrete barrier. I mean, I think it's better for everybody. Um, any comments? Yes, sir. I don't know if this would be real, real relevant, but I thought it might be helpful for your information. I have a copy of the quick claim deed from uh, 
uh, to Marathon Oil um, on that property and part of the, the restrictions and covenants as part of that deed is that the property shall only be utilized for green space and the defined is used for, uh, uh, shall not be used for any single family or multifamily residential, commercial, or industrial purpose. The property is maintained at least in its native state following construction for beneficial use of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, which includes a, a property may be used as community park, uh, trails, volleyball courts, tennis courts, and so forth. So that's in the, in the deed to the marathon. Well, thank you for sharing that important piece of information. I don't, uh, it doesn't look that that property is going to be developed anytime soon, and I will, I will support um, this case if we can put a gate that, because they do need access that is locked, and I also feel like the neighbor's concerns are valid, and I will, uh, if we can also add something about landscaping, or, you know, you might need lighting in the area, we need to make sure we're not bothering the neighbors as well, so maybe some extra landscaping to make sure either noise that might be in Sundays when you know, the church is busy or even the lighting during the evening just to uh, have an extra barrier. It's quiet. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, I'll support it with the, uh, uh, what Anna just said, the gate and, uh, you know, landscaping. You can't do wrong with landscaping on is there any particular kind of landscaping that you would want to specify as a condition for the variance? And where the landscaping would go? Yeah. Are we uh, talking about uh, along the north property line backing up to those houses, just the length of the new it, drive? And I'm sorry, I'm not an expert looking at this, but I will be thinking between the driveway and the fence in that north side of the property line, and it's possible landscaping that goes above if there's a fence in that area. I'm just trying to, you know, the views of the neighborhoods, if anything, or just lighting or noise or anything, landscaping usually helps with all of that. So is that We're specific enough? Uh, trees 20 foot on center, the length of the drive that they're putting in now. I, I'm just trying to figure out when I write no, this, what I'm putting in. That sounds about right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, my main concern is the, the access and the gate. And, um, I'm good with the landscaping. Um, with that said, uh, approve application 14598 or motion to approve by reasons that it meets the uh, statutory requirement for a variance. I'll second. And we have a motion and a second to approve the variance. Cast your vote. It's been approved. Item number eight, case number 14600, application for a special exception to allow lodging accommodations home sharing in the R2 medium low residential district located at 1223 North McKinley Avenue. Um, hi, my name is Allison Alt, and I live at 3956 uh, Calamas Street in Denver. The property I'm referencing I own, I purchased in uh, March, and that is at 1223 North McKinley Avenue. Um, I am requesting to get the special exception for the home sharing license um, to be able to rent the ADU unit, which is attached to the back side of the house um, for home sharing through Airbnb. Uh, I have family in nearby Missouri and Tulsa, and I'm often in the area, and it's just nice to be able to have somewhere where I can stay. And so with uh, home sharing, I can rent that part of the house for less than 30 days, it's furnished. Um, the front part of the house is separate from the ADU and it's two bed, two bath, which I will rent to a tenant. Right now I'm rehabbing the property um, and I have a property manager who will manage it since I don't live in the area. How many years are you asking for? Um, 10 years. 
And uh, with respect to that uh, accessibility for the uh, the different uh, in the home share arrangement versus the living arrangement and accessibility in the driving driveways and that kind of thing. Um, so the driveways are separate. Um, the driveway to the main part of the house is off of North McKinley Avenue facing the uh, McKinley Park. And then the driveway to the ADU unit is around the corner uh, from 12th Northwest. He's pulling up. Oh yeah, so there's a photo right there. So the ADU unit is what's the back side of the house, which is on the west side. Um, and the uh, driveway comes in from the north to the ADU unit. And then the driveway access to the house is from North McKinley Avenue on the east side going west toward the house. So you currently have the main house lease, is that correct? Um, the property is currently being rehabbed. And so it's in phase one of the rehabilitation. Um, but I have a property management company that will be um, in charge of getting the place rented once the construction is finished. Yeah, I was going to ask about that since you are not even living anywhere mm -hmm. nearby. How, how, what kind of controls do you have over uh, how, how this whole operation will be working? Um, well, I mean, I assume it would be similar to someone who does have a primary residence here and when they rent their house out their way. Um, so I have a point of contact locally. Her name is Tara Levinson. And so she would be the person who would be able to check on the house if there were any issues. Um, but I have direct contact with any uh, short-term rental tenants who would be occupying the ADU unit um, and also security cameras on the exterior of the building. Um, and then when I have a tenant in the house, then I would be able to contact the tenant to have them check on anything. Board members, questions? None. No, I don't have any questions. Uh, and it's come up, uh, this is, I think, our second application, so <laughs> this is, we're new at this. Uh, the ordinance allows us to grant it a special exception um, for up to 10 years, but, um, and we have previously uh, approved one for five, and the person, the board member who uh, proposed that is not here today, but I didn't know if you all had any thoughts regarding the number of years that the exception should be granted for. In this particular case, I think five years might be advisable personally because of the nature of where the uh, applicant lives and some other things. I don't know, but we're not trying to set precedent. No, I just no, say no. there's no guidance on. Well, we've already kind of set precedent if we did the first one at five years. I mean, but it's 10, so I'm good with five years. It's a good number to me. I go with that. I'll be okay with that. Uh, I personally feel um, good about this application just because of the fact that you do have two driveways, so it's not gonna, you're gonna have more cars in the in the streets and bothering maybe the neighbors or in the evenings there, so. Any uh, comments or responses before we have a motion? David? <coughs> Anybody want to be heard on this matter? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I will uh, move for approval of case number one four six zero zero of a special exception for five years. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Let's cast our votes. Special exception has been granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are at the end um, of our meeting. Any board members, anybody have any comments or 
Anything? Okay, consider yourselves adjourned. We are adjourned. <laughs>